so welcome to Town Hall 91. It's Wednesday, August 10th. Can't believe we've done 91 of these. Uh, oh, seems like amazing. yesterday. Yep. Seems like yesterday when the pandemic happened. Uh, we were all deer caught in the headlights for sure. Deer, absolutely. So let's, uh, it, it's funny too, how much this relates to this too, because of what, you know, how much uh, change the, the pandemic brought on. Uh, my name is John Best. I'm the CEO, co-founder of Best Innovation Group. And with me is Longtime friend, uh, the best journalist in the American credit union business. Oh my gosh, come now. Oh <laughs> uh, no, it's true. Mike Lawson. Hey, Mike. How are you doing, sir? Well, thank you for those kind words, John. And of course, uh, it is well, likewise on your behalf as well. And as well as our guest today too. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Mm. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. So let's uh, let's get through. Oh, and oh, also, Glenn. Oh my gosh, Glenn. Glenn is here. Is he yeah, here? I hear he is here. He should be. So... Uh, I'm sure he'll pop on if he's not already here in just a few minutes. So Glenn Cervati. Um let's get through the let's get through this real fast, the sponsor, so we can get sure. to the good stuff. So yep. hey, guess what? Uh, I'm going to be at a CUNA uh, CUNA meeting, the CEO um, roundtable coming up in uh, coming up in Santa Fe, New Mexico next month. Very oh, excited wow. about that. Um, it's funny because a lot of topics from Chris's book are on my list to discuss with them. So. Uh, I want to ask them what they all stand for. You know, I, I think they <laughs> they probably should know the answer to that. So we'll 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 see what happens from that. But if you're looking for a great place to go and, and learn more and connect with other uh, like minded as well as maybe not like minded uh, peers and other folks in this industry, CUNA is the place to go. Um, there's always great meetings, great conferences, and they have one for every discipline. Doesn't matter where you work at the credit union. There is an opportunity for you to learn either online or in person at the conference. Go check it out, cuna.org. Yep. I'll let you do the next one. Yeah, well, before we get to the next one, John, are you gonna be at the tech conference at the tech council in I I late September? I believe I will, yes. Cool, cool. I, well, I hope to see you there, sir. I think that's in Las Vegas, actually. So anyway, hey- Wait, wait, you're, you're gonna be there? I'm, fingers crossed, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Melissa, right. take note of that. We'll talk later. <laughs> All right, go ahead. <laughs> Please let me remove, remove from that attendee list. Anyway, <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, if you're creating out there looking for a new uh, core processor correlation, they are the future of credit unions for sure. John, if you were starting a credit union today, big federal credit union, something like that, and you and there's so many fintechs out there to BF, work with. BFF. BFF, best yes, forever. your best yeah, the BFF credit, credit union forever. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so their their open architecture allows folks to, allows credit unions to work with just about any fintech out there. So, I mean, you're it's kind of like I, the they have everything I'd be looking for. That would be exactly. top of the list, particularly uh, knowing kind of the future of this market and where we're going. Exactly, in integration is everything. So, exactly, a, a very forward thinking bunch there at Correlation. But if you want to find out more, go check them out at correlationinc.com. That's all the information's there. Great people, fantastic product, and a great customer service as well. So, John, member pass. Let's talk about sure. member pass. Imagine that uh, you were living every day in a, a beautiful country, and one day your neighbor country said, "Hey, guess what?" You're ours now. You've always been part of our land. <laughs> and you they came in and you had to run away to another country uh, adjacent to the country you're in. How would you prove who you are and what you do? How would you make a living in this new place? And I think it's uh, very interesting that um, and interesting that you know member pass was was a solution to that. It's a, it's a, it's a non-governmental solution for you to carry credentials from place to place that mm -hmm. isn't owned by anyone but you. Yep. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about it using it just for general purpose of, hey, you know, the hassle of the call center or the hassle of other things. But it's, it's really a powerful platform for, uh, in particular, being able to, to you know, prove who you are. And this is precisely one of its use cases. So we'll yep. get more to that. Do you hear the scratching at the door? I hear scratching. This is not good. Um, the dog? I, I the believe deer? it might be. We're going to leave the, the dog. We're going to, yeah. So that's Member Pass. Go check it out. It's it's a, it's a fantastic platform. Uh, something that you, <laughs> I, I got to make it stop. I think it's because there's thunder and she doesn't like that. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Best Innovation Group, John. Yeah, yeah. What's the latest going on there? Let's give you guys a plug. Sure. We are, dead. We are coming to Florida next week. Uh, we're going to be going to Florida to do our innovation club. We're going to be doing things with this. I got the hollow lens here. Oh, this cool. is kind of my uh, analog for Google Glass when it comes out. Like, hey, oh. what's that going to be like to have sort of this 
augmented reality that may possibly be something you'd be willing to wear outdoors. Like yeah. someone like Chris probably wear this right into a grocery store. That's my feeling. <laughs> um, so we're going to be looking at robots. We're going to be looking at AI. We're going to be talking about uh, a lot of different uh, creating technology. We're going to talk about the sort of the anthropology of money. Uh, Cause I think that's become a, a hot use case in the sense of what's going on with web three, why everybody thinks crypto is, is the, the future of that. What, you know, we need good answers for that. We need to understand. And, and uh, so we're going to be kind of dipping into that. Uh, folks like Fernando part of uh, will be there. Who is also with uh, currently, you know, I believe Willis is chair, but I think Fernando is a big part of it too. The, the tech uh, piece. So, and if you're looking for learning what's going on, you got to go to see you broadcast. That's the place to be. Uh, everything I've ever learned about finance, fintech, credit unions, <laughs> I've learned from my man, Mike Lawson. But let's get to our special guest. Yes, I mean, indeed. I, I, I grow tired of these sponsors. I want to get to the meat. Mr. Chris Skinner, he has written, I believe, if I got my count right, 17, this being the 17th book. Is that Chris? all? Wow. Yep. Uh, I, I would say 20, 22 if you include the kiddies books. Uh, 17 <laughs> business books. 17 business books and, and five the, children's books and five children's books, a prolific author, wow. uh, a prolific blogger, a really nice person to hang out with, uh, and someone who has a, a, a view, a particular view, and is well known in, in the world of finance and, and is, uh, you know, has just finished a new book, which I, I find fascinating and, and something we want to discuss. But before we get there, before we get there, a lot of you may or may not know that, um, Chris is actually located in Warsaw. And so Chris, tell us what's going on. How's your family? Tell us about that environment, what that world looks like, what the impact is. Because a lot of what you talk about is precisely for these kinds of issues, right? For this, this sort of thing that sort of happened to you in the last like six months. Yeah, I mean, I'm living in Warsaw, um, just outside in fact, in Poland. And um, a lot of people seem surprised by that, which uh, I'm not sure why, I suppose it's because I'm, have an English accent, um, but Poland is the fifth largest European economy uh, behind Germany, France, Italy, Spain. It's a renewed society. It's very open and um, it's cost effective compared to the UK. Um, a lot of people who work here are particularly in lower income roles coming from Ukraine before what happened in uh, February. Uh, and then suddenly in February, you know, over 3 million people came across the border. And to put that in context, there's 39 million people in Poland. So suddenly the population increased by 10% almost overnight. Wow. Uh, many of those have moved on to Germany and to other parts of Europe. Um, and if I'm honest, we're not that affected by the Ukraine-Russian frictions, apart from worrying about another Chernobyl. And that would be the biggest issue because uh, Ukraine has the largest nuclear power plants of, in Europe. And if I'm honest, it wouldn't matter if one of them blew up, whether I was in Poland or Germany um, or anywhere else in Europe, it would cover the whole of Europe. Yeah, and well, so that, I, I was there during Chernobyl. I remember that. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest issue we have today. Um, apart from that, obviously, the war itself, you know, the end of day, I, I, I you know, Putin is looking for an exit, uh, and I'm not a, an expert on politics, so I don't know what the exit plan would be, but I'm guessing you have this part of eastern Ukraine and take it from there. Um, yeah. And specifically, for those who don't know the background, you may all think that Russia is in, in the wrong. Actually, there is a very strong case for Russia to take back Ukraine, if you look at history, um, and that's why the war is taking place. Yeah, I think that uh, well, Putin has always has always said that, and, and there was a long time play, even with going back to the space race, where Ukraine was where all the space resources were. So, well, uh, we're thankful you're here. We're thankful that uh, the country you're in is is so well taken care of of the refugees. But uh, you know, to your point about this, though, this is a good example of of sort of the, the kind of thing you stand for, Chris, which is, you know, the the human rights, the 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 climate control, the the idea that we've got to do good in this world, you know, and that's really what I took away from the book, the new book was, hey, 
you know, we should be standing for something. And in general, we should be doing good in some way or another uh, for the world. You had a lot of people write chapters on it. You had some incredible people uh, in the book who, who from, you know, from uh, the various, uh, various people out there, uh, Tom Blofield, one of the founders of Mo uh, Monzo, uh, Gore from the Discovery thing, which is it, which was very interesting because some of the groups you you actually had speak in there were a little controversial. But anyways, get, getting back to that, let's 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 just jump right in because when I read your book, I was struck, and, and we had this conversation before. But you you talk about sort of stakeholder capitalism versus shareholder capitalism, and maybe you could just start there because Crayons should just latch onto this, and and I'm very interested in sort of that explanation for everybody so that we can decide whether Crayons are really living that uh, right now. I think there's a number of bubbling themes that the book embodies, um, beginning in fact, in the 2000s when we had the financial crisis, um, which was mainly America and Europe. And um, the chair of the regulatory body in the, in the UK, Lord Adair Turner said that a lot of what banking does is socially useless. And there's a big debate around this afterwards and whether banks had lost their moral compass. And I think when you look at the examples of Wells Fargo with account openings, or you look at what happened with um, payments insurance in the UK, which has cost the UK banks billions for giving people insurance policies that they didn't sign up for, or in Australia, um, banks that were charging premiums for advice to people who died years ago, uh, which created a Royal Commission that found them at fault and fined them uh, millions of dollars. You know, banks definitely switched from being socially useful and being part of community and I know we're talking credit unions here so you know part of community is a very important factor in the small institutions but when you look at the big banks in particular um you know this socially useless losing their moral compass debate started uh, 15 years ago it's been ongoing and then at the end of the 2010s um we started seeing uh, more activity towards this idea of stakeholder capitalism, uh, actually led by the Business Roundtable, which was chaired by Jamie Dimon, the Chief Executive and Chairman of JP Morgan Chase, uh, who delivered a manifesto in October 2019 saying that um, employees and customers and community are just as important as shareholders. Um, I don't think they actually live that idea yet. But I think that is the idea. And particularly for Gen Z or Z, because I'm British, millennials, you know, for the younger generations, uh, that was really making me think a lot about what does banking actually exist for? Is it for the good of the people, the good of society, or the just to make money? Um, and if it's only there just to make money, is that actually the right thing? And I didn't want to stand on a pulpit preaching to the masses and saying, this is my view of the world. So, as you said, John, I invited everyone from all the continents of the world to contribute to the book from um, South America through Africa, Asia, um, and obviously USA. Um, I didn't include uh, the Arctic and Antarctic because penguins and polar bears don't really speak very well. But apart from True. that... It's it's pretty much everyone. I hear they're really into crypto, though. That's I heard that. <laughs> Go and get the polo coin, or, or is it the <laughs> penguin coin? Penguin the coin. Penguin I think coin. That, yes. that, that would work. Yeah, I think there's a polar coin as well. But yeah. So, so you wrote you wrote this. You brought all these folks in, and you had this concept of of uh, hey, am I just? You know, I like your point here. Like, I can't just stand in the pulpit and say everyone should be doing good for the neighborhood because I'm Chris Skinner and this is what I believe. It's, I think John froze, Chris, in the middle I'm of one of his. I was wondering if it was my no. PC. Anyway, <laughs> it's obviously because I mentioned the Arctic and, and Antarctic that you froze. That's exactly how appropriate. <laughs> how appropriate. But one of the things that I mean, I, we uh, interviewed you, uh, you know, a couple of months or a month or so ago, Chris. And one of the things I, that I asked you in our interview was, 
dealing with the unbanked, because there's a lot of that in the in the US, obviously. There's a lot of it obviously worldwide. But you gave an example about India, how they went from 35% banked to 80% banked in six years. So can you share a little bit about that and, and how they did that? Because I, I found that fascinating. And maybe credit unions could take a, a you know an idea or a spark an idea or something like that from that. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, India is a exceptional example because the government there rolled out a program called the India Stack, which is a technology stack that they built from scratch over the last 20 years, beginning with digital identity, which is called Aadhaar. And now everyone in India has the ability to access financial services because they can use their fingerprint, which um, is where that began. It's now moving right. forward into... Uh, much more sort of additional services. Uh, they also have what they call the United Payments Interface, which Google, in fact, is leading in India. Um, and that's all about making payments very simple. So in my case, I was in Bangladesh a couple of years ago and visited a temple, and I could donate to the temple with cash or with a QR code. Uh, and that's because the technology capabilities have been built bearing in mind that most people have access to a telephone. Right. And this is a point I've been making for years, that if you have access to a telephone, you have access to trade and transact as well as talk. Yep. And um, some people still say to me, uh, a bit of a pipe dream, Chris, because there's only so many mobile phone users. And then I go, well, actually, even if you're in the most remote area of the world, you can probably get access to a phone. Yep. And to emphasize that point, and this is embarrassing because it's showing my age. But in the mid-1990s, I said, one day someone will make, will make a payment from the top of Mount Everest using a mobile, <laughs> mobile phone. And amazingly, they did in about seven years ago uh, as a as actually a promotional thing for Standard Charter's uh, Breeze app. But they made a payment from the top of Mount Everest. Yeah, came true. Came true. Yeah, it's just, it's amazing how far we've come in such a short time. And now we have John back. So John, we were just talking about, cause you were just talking about Antarctica and Arctic and, and you froze. So yeah, yeah. This was, that's, one, uh, this was the one who pointed that out. Yeah, it was perfect. It was perfect timing. Uh, apparently my dog was uh, very much right about whatever storm is probably pretty far off that hit me here. Uh, apologies for that. But yeah, I was, I was chatting about uh, we, you know, the idea that you had gone to all the corners of the world to, to have people talk about this idea of, the social usefulness of a bank and what they should, what they should, which leads us to that title, you know, stand for something or you're gone. Um, and with that in mind, as I look at the credit unions, we have had this, and I'm just going to be flat honest here. Cause I think most people on this call would, would agree. We've been trying to become these banks forever. We really have, we, we sort of have been sort of in this process uh, it started off as products and services, which I think makes sense. We want to provide those same products and services, but we also have been sort of along the way because those products and services are a cultural piece as well, have been shifting culturally towards that and the idea um, of this sort of stakeholder versus shareholder. Because you could argue either in the Craigian space, because we don't have a, a true, you know, uh, a true share, you know, shareholder, the, the, the organization is, is a cooperative, even in Germany and other places like Rafisen that are, are also built that way. Poland in particular has a few. So how do you see these sorts of units? Are these units set up now because they sort of could operate or did operate that way as being, uh, you know, something that could live in that model you're talking about this idea of financial wealth and health connecting to each other? Yeah. Uh, I mean, another, so the theme of the book is what is the purpose of banking and of your organization? And in fact, when I present these days, I start with three or four questions to the audience, which is, who are you? Why are you here? What do you exist for? And the point of those questions is actually not to ask you that as a personal question, but to then say, ask that of your organization. And when most banks were started, uh, the big banks, you know, the cities, Wells Fargo's, JP Morgan Chase, Barclays, HSBC, they were all founded with founding principles and people who believed in something about building 
a better world, but they lost that because they are now over a century or more in existence. And those founding principles are no longer there. I, I think they do exist within a lot of your uh, listeners to this discussion, because when you talk about community banks and credit unions, which I normally use in the same breath, uh, maybe I shouldn't, but I do think they exist very much for their their members, um, and so and certainly outside America, we talk about mutuals rather than thrifts, which again very much exist for their members. Um, and you know, in the UK, for example, we have building societies. The whole point was to build societies. You know, that that was why they're called that. Um, right. You know, we help we help you with building a home, building a community, building sort of a brethren, which you know, faceless banking that lost its moral compass and became socially useless, lost. And so that's the challenge in the book, which is, can you bring back the founding principles to your organization? And part of it is actually not to say um, the big banks have to do that. It's to say, it's amazing how many young fintech companies I talk to where that they are young and their founders are still at the top of the company with founding principles and they are Gen Z or Gen Z um, millennials and they do truly believe in and passionately have a view of what they stand for. And if you don't stand for something, you fall. And that's the point. Yeah, I, I, I think as I, I look at that and I try to translate it to the future, because that's a lot of what we're doing here. A lot of what you've written about in the past is becoming digital, the digital human. And so when I relate those two things, how can technology, because that's really what we're struggling with, right? When you when you kind of compare us and you compare them and you go, okay, Chase has you know all the money in the world. And to your point, he, he, he came out and he paid lip service to the, this fundamental idea that you're talking about, this transition from uh, shareholder to stakeholder and, and who are the people that we're really servicing. But at the end of the day, uh, their money is immense for that, right? How do, you, how do you see this evolving with the technology we have today? Um, are there good examples of that? Like anybody who's who's really you know, taken this and said, hey, I'm, I want to do this and, and, and this is how we're going to stand. We're going to stand for financial health and this is how we do it. Uh, yeah, that, there's a number of good examples in the book. And, um, and I'm thinking again, of one in particular, but I'm trying to softball you because, you know, I'm your buddy. So. But, again, being contextual, um, a lot of people are still struggling with the idea of digital transformation. And my view is if you haven't done it by now, then you're actually too late. You know, it, it's done and dusted by most people um, or should have been by now. And now we're talking about how can we use digital transformation in a continuum of getting better forever to help communities and society uh, and the economy and the world to get better. And part of that was inspired actually by Ant Group, who featured in Digital Human, uh, which is the Chinese Alipay uh, company um, that's run on the basis that uh, you should be able to get everyone included in making digital payments through their super app um, within the Alibaba e-commerce network. There's a long story behind it. Um, it's 30,000 words of digital human. So you know, just summarizing one part of that is that one employee one day had an idea that maybe when you make a payment, you could make it something that reflected how green your payment was, as in how environmentally friendly your payment that you just made was and whether you use you know um buses more than taxis more than your car and you get more points for using a bus than a taxi or a car um and that became the world's largest multi multiplayer game um 600 million people in china now play ant forest which is the idea of one employee from alipay to create a more envi environmentally fr friendly program and what do you get if you actually play the game? Well, you get to plant trees, and they've planted millions of trees. In fact, it's probably now billions of trees, um, which is obviously helping the oxygenation of the planet, particularly in Asia. Um, I've seen that copied by others. So there's a really interesting company that's called Arlen's Bank and from Finland that created a program to do something similar for the Baltic Sea, where every time you use your card, 
debit or credit card, you get a recognition of whether that was a payment that helps the world. And if it does, then they invest more in um, rejuvenating the oceans. And they sold that as a white label service to many other companies, including some of the big card companies that's now used by over 100 million people worldwide. Um, I loved the purpose of Discovery Group. You mentioned Adrian Gore, who's the founder. Um, it's a 26-year-old bank uh, and started as an insurance company. Yeah, this company. is the one I thought was cool, yeah. Yeah, they started as an insurance company. And the whole idea is to build wealth through health. So if you uh, sign up for their uh, health insurance, for example, you get a Fitbit and it actually monitors whether you go to the gym and work out. And if you do, then your premiums are lowered compared to those who don't go to the gym. Um, so it's encouraging you to get uh, healthy and wealthy at the same time. Um, I loved what Tom in Monzo said when they founded Monzo is to make financial services accessible to everybody. And one of the big issues that they tackled is the homelessness. And that if you are homeless, obviously you don't get a bank account because you don't have a, an address. But why is that? Uh, and if someone backed you and was like a guardian who, uh, you know, was saying that you're good enough for the account, surely that would be enough to open an account for a homeless person. And that's what they ended up launching. So if I said, John's good for the money, then, you know, looking at you, John, obviously, if you're homeless, then uh, I would be your guardian. That would be excellent if you would be my guardian. It's it's interesting because it has a real world translation. Just a couple of days ago here in Tennessee, they passed a law that makes it criminal to be homeless. And wow. so the, everyone moves to San Francisco. Yeah, well, it's it, I mean, that's the purpose I think that Tennessee wants. But when they went and talked to the people, they said, OK, well, they kind of showed both sides of it in the news. And they said, well, why uh, why are you why are you here? And they said, well. I went to the shelters. I didn't like the shelters. Uh, I prefer uh, this public land. And and when you look at the technology they have to live homeless, it's not so bad. You know, it's like they got these tents oh. and they've got iPads and, 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 you know, they, they, they can afford to, to go and work on these uh, to work in this particular way, but you're but, right. They can't bank. And that leads to these payday lenders. When I watch the fo folks here are homeless, they go right to the payday lenders and so, I don't know, it's yep. just a, another round of that that I was seeing. It almost takes us down a, a rabbit hole, which is, um, you know, there's lots of communities around the world that I've encountered that buck the system uh, with a B. Um, and the best example I can give you is in Copenhagen. Uh, and there's a community there in an uh, area called Christiania who have been set up for almost half a century as a um, stateless uh, non-governmental community. Um, and that gets us into then decentralized finance and the whole idea of democratization of financial services because effectively libertarians, and Christiania is a very good example of a libertarian community, want to have their own ability to do whatever they want. And the argument against that is, but you're using our electricity grid, you're using our utilities like our water companies, and you need to pay for that. And so that friction has existed for a long time. Uh, what I find interesting today, and it's maybe the theme of my next book, I haven't decided yet, but I think the friction around decentralization of finance versus governmental control is a huge debate. And in fact, Brett, who's a good friend of mine, Brett King, and who you know as well, you know, his latest book, Techno Brett, Socialism. Brett. Yeah, kind of whatever. Um, yeah. But he kind of, he's he's delved into this a bit. Um, and what was interesting is a lot of people don't like the title of the book because it's got socialism <laughs> in the title. Sure. And it's like, you can't say that. Um, why can't you say well, that? Well, exactly. It's because there's a, there's a, a stigma attached to it that socialism is handouts and that's well, it's like communism it's this whole lefty red russian you know whatever thing from the cold war um mm. and, but that friction hasn't gone away and it's nothing to do with geography it's to do with some people don't want to live within the system right and that's more and more happening and as a matter of fact i think that 
more and more people are doing. That's why I was interested in the the Monzo piece. So has that moved anywhere else? Is anybody else doing anything like that? Or any other countries that you could be homeless and get a mentor and get a account? Um, not too sure at the moment, John. I, I mean, Monzo, I think, struggled with it. And so they haven't rolled it out as fully as I would have hoped. Um, what they have done, which I think has been copied, and this is quite interesting, is they had another program to um, help people who have addictions to block their addictions through their bank account. So if you gamble too much, you can put a block on access to gambling services on your bank account. And that's been copied by Starling, by HSBC, and by quite a few others. That sort of service definitely is making a, a, an impact and a change. And you can, you can unblock it, but it, it takes you like 14 days. So the whole idea is if, you, if you're worried about what you're doing with drinking or drugs or gambling, then you can stop doing that and the bank will help you. It's like the old days of putting your credit card and freezing it in a block of ice, right? Some people still do that. Some people still do it. Yeah. So so let's talk about this concept of DeFi governance. So I, I find that fascinating, particularly when you talk about libertarians, right? So there's this idea that DeFi, that money is free and it just sort of needs to flow like the water across the land and and that the penguins and the polar bears will have access to it and and that they're that, you know, the governmental access uh and then when you talk about the other side of it, well, we need some sort of regulation, some sort of control. Everybody kind of runs the other way. It goes, well, why? Wait a minute. We don't want the Fed or, or all these people involved. Where is there middle ground? What does that like? What does that look like? And, and in particular, I look at like um, the folks uh, in in some of these other countries, uh, Venezuela comes to mind, where the money becomes worthless or or the government changes hands. And when it does, the banks get taken over. And, and so- there's, it seems like there's a use case for both, but and you mentioned ESG a bit. Maybe talk into that a little bit before we get to. I want to ask you a little bit about Web3 as well, but go ahead. <laughs> so um, where we are right now is a very interesting time in that there's definitely the opportunity to create a non-government operated currency. Uh it will not be a fiat currency. It will not be a US dollar or a euro or a yuan or whatever you want to talk about. Um, it will be a networked currency. Um, exactly how that operates and looks. Um, people today would talk about Bitcoin or Ethereum, but there's also lots of others like Solano and um, Cordano and Polygon and uh, Dogecoin or Dogecoin. Well, that's how I call it. Um, there's lots of other stuff out there. You know, at the moment, there's over 10,000 active cryptocurrencies, which is ridiculous. Um, eventually, there will be one, maybe two or three. Um, and how they're structured and how they run, we don't know. And I've always said to libertarians, the issue I have with Bitcoin and any other cryptocurrency is you cannot have money without government. It's a foundational principle of how society operates. And they always go to me, oh, you're a statist or a statist. You know, you believe in, you know, the Federal Reserve and, um, you know, the power of the American Washington, D.C. And I go, that's not what I said. You know, what I said is you cannot have money without government. I didn't say what government. I didn't say it has to be national government. It could be quite easily a networked government, which is what Bitcoin is based upon. Um, and the network government says, as long as 50.1% of the network says that's a valid transaction, then the transaction goes through. Um, but that is not yet structured the right way. And so there's lots of things happening. And by way of example, the latest thing is Ethereum, um, who I'm quite a fan of, moving from um, proof of work to proof of stake. So the difference is proof of work is you have to mine the currencies and prove you did the work. Proof of stake is you just say, you know, here's a thousand dollars that I can show that I've got. Therefore, my stake is a thousand dollars that proves I've got that stake in the network and can back it up. Um, this gets really interesting. And 
I think it's interesting in, in so many perspectives around where we're going because you know most banking services are only a couple of hundred years old and yet humans are a couple of hundred thousand years old so if we now have a new networked economy with the government that's networked through connectivity how does that change everything well that depends so is money a shared belief or is money a uh, you've been a reading construct. my stuff too much you've been reading my stuff too much i've just uh, i mean but but because often I, on my on my blog i, I say money is just invented yeah. you know it's, it's it's a it's just a belief you know yeah uh, one of my i, I use by the way I, that's a that's a compliment i'm not going to take that as a slur i read you no, stuff you're, you're very kind i appreciate the compliment john because you know time is just a belief you know we just invented it it doesn't exist uh, Albert Einstein. We're about to find that, that out when quantum hits. So we're about to find out what time really is. I, I suspect. Oh. But <laughs> back to the future. Um, but Albert Einstein actually said, made that quote. You know, time is just something that we invented. Borders is something we just invented. You know, go- countries don't exist. Um, companies were just invented. Um, we made them up. So right. You, you think Wells or City is a big bank? It's not. It's just a fictional creation of legal instruments. And the trouble with that is that if you roll it back to that basic view of the world, that's when the DeFi decentralized finance starts to become a reality. Because you can then say, well, if we made those things up, we can make something else up. Well, yeah, it's that's why I say I'm not sure it's a shared belief. I mean, I think it's a construct that you're forced to work in. Right. If I went outside and said, I no longer believe in money and I refuse to use it. I don't think that would go well for me. I think that, uh, you know, I might get some, well, some then pushback you, on that. You, you bring in the, the, another dimension of what's important in cryptocurrency, which is c- consensus mechanisms. You know, you have to have a consensus. Um, right. And we you have, have to that. have a shared it, network. Yeah. I, I mean, we have that right now with, um, you know, the, the US dollar and Visa and MasterCard and such like. But we could have that tomorrow quite easily with um, you know, a currency that's networked. Well, it, so let's talk about that network for a thing. So it's it's interesting to me because we're, here's how my analog for the current, uh, you, you mentioned all the coins, right? So in the, I want to say 90s, ATM networks started to pop up, remember? And there were all these little ones. They were everywhere. I don't know if, you know, most of the people on this call probably remember, but there was a time, Glenn and I talk about this all the time when, you had to like break out your credit card. I think I have one here. And, you know, it has, this one only has little four bugs on the back anymore. But, you know, there was a zillion of them on the gas station pump. And like some of them kind of looked the same. Like there was an extra E in it for whatever reason. It was the same logo. And your whole goal was, well, I hope this will work, you know, and you plugged it in. And then came Visa and MasterCard and, and Plus and, uh, oh, what's the other network? Um, Discover. Cirrus. Yeah, it was serious. And Discover was the third rail. Discover was interesting. That was the Sears rail, but we'll get there. I've always thought that the Grayans should have bought Discover. We had a chance to buy Discover. That would have been the biggest and best thing we ever did, but I digress. So anyways, you got these and they sort of collapsed all those networks together and finally made one sort of big rail between the two. Is that what you see happening? Is this uh, sort of um, uh, this, uh, you know, where it congeals into sort of one thing or at least close to one thing with a couple options, kind of, you know, parallel winners? I'd like to say yes, but I really don't know. Um, in the, I, I can predict a lot of things around technology. And the issue I have with um, decentralized finance versus centralized finance, which people are shortening to DeFi versus CEFI, mm-hmm. um, and, and Sapphire Central Bank Digital Currencies, C- CBDCs, you know, the digital dollar, um, is technologically, they both make absolute sense. And I'm a technologist. So w- what I look at with technology is what makes sense. And for years, I've said it makes sense to do video banking. It makes sense to move to um, payments using apps or um, contactless Um and those technologies, you know, biometrics, for example, have, have been very predictable that eventually they would become mainstream. So face ID and touch ID, absolutely obvious that it eventually would happen. From a technological perspective, the issue is always when is the right timing for it to happen? 
So I used to work for NCR, the ATM company, and we were experimenting with uh, recognizing your eyeballs at the ATM in the 1990s. It was way before it was prime time. Now it's prime time, so you, you can do that. Um, but when you look at the future, it's not just technological, which is where I come from. It's political and economic and social. And specifically, when we talk about DeFi and SEFI, central versus decentralized finance, this the political and economic structures that start to come into play that I can't predict. You know, so I can absolutely tell you that it technologically is very easy to roll out a global decentralized currency that's managed by the network's consent consensus politically i that's completely unacceptable right it, it would be and culturally in some ways too right because there are some cultures that culturally no I, I i disagree with you i think culturally i would quite like to have a currency that doesn't have the fed well i i'm talking more about like how values exchanged in other cultures I, I think well, that cult, cult, I mean, culturally, you know, you, you mentioned earlier Venezuela, but El Salvador and some of the African nations and others are now saying, you know, we, we're quite happy to run with our own national currency, the US dollar and Bitcoin. Um, some of them have done that, I think, just for, you know, gaining um, headlines. Yeah. 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 But, I, I, you know, yeah. maybe that is the way of the future that we run with our own currency, uh, maybe some tied to the US dollar or some other reserve currency and a digital currency. Well, and let's, so speaking of that culturally, so I'm going to roll us into this other universe for the last half of this, which is the web three sort of metaverse concept. So, you know, we talk a lot about the metaverse. I've been doing a ton of work in that space lately, uh, more around sort of the research work on, on, what's coming out, you know, clearly Meta has made a big bet on this. I think that um, there are others that will follow behind. But yet, whenever I hear about Web3, whenever you sort of talk about these things, uh, it's always sort of tied to crypto. And in my mind, credit cards still work. Uh, you know, cash won't work in the metaverse. That'll be difficult. But, you know, we, we still have these other rails. The, the challenge is these other rails don't have the functionality I think that's going to be necessary for sort of the metaverse concepts. And, and, th and just to give you the spin your head a little bit, here's what I've been thinking of it a lot about, not that it matters, but my next book is going to be called Chris Skinner, digital twin. And what happens is, is that everything you buy, you get a digital twin for a full digital twin. I think that's a future and that's a digital asset that'll be need to be stored in the metaverse. And it has a lot of use cases It has use cases like, What's the specific part that's in my car? Was did it come out of the Toyota that was built in in the Fukushima, you know, plant, or was it done in Tennessee, you know, at the Nissan plant here? What, you know, so this idea that the metaverse sort of runs in this this crypto space, I can see why, because tying those assets and contracts to that makes some sense. It's it's more than money, but yet. I'm not sure everyone understands that use case and that's not what's motivating them to say that crypto is part of the metaverse, but I'll, I'll leave you there. I'm, my head's kind of hurting a little bit from reading too much Chris Skinner. So go ahead. Well, no, I, I mean, the metaverse has been bubbling for quite a while um, and will continue to bubble. Um, I always put it in the context of the things I like. So Star Trek, the next generation, had the holodeck and that to me is the metaverse you know that you basically yeah. op open the door you walk into another world you you are living there and feeling like you're really there but it's somewhere else um and it's artificial um and then people say so the metaverse will be run on crypto and you won't need banks and blah 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 and i go no because um the first example of a metaverse that took off big time was Second Life, which was about 15 years ago. And Second Life disintegrated because their banking system collapsed, because their banking system wasn't regulated. And long story short, Linden Labs, who ran Second Life, eventually said the only way you can be a bank in the virtual world is if you're a bank in reality. And that became law. 
And to me, that's what the metaverse will be, that you know, the only way you can be a bank in the metaverse is if you're a bank in reality, that you have a license. And I, I always come back to, you know, yes, I can have money without government um, if the network is my government. Um, so, you know, there's still a government, but it's not a national government. But who regulates the network's bank and financial system? And can you do that through an algorithm or does that need an authority? And those questions are the questions that, as I mentioned before, we're still wrestling with. And we'll wrestle with those in the metaverse. You know, Does the metaverse bank have to have a regulatory license and authority and who issues that license and authority? Well, and that goes back to the shared belief, right? Where if you don't believe in the authority, and that's the problem with the algorithm is you have to believe that yep. that algorithm is foolproof, and, right? And, and we've right seen now, examples the, of that. And right now, the issue that most people will have is they've lost their life savings on crypto, and so yep. they've lost their belief. Yeah, and then it, and it's going to take a whole lot to bring that back because that trust has to be re-earned. It, it, it isn't just going to come back from another uh, round of Wall Street bets or something. Yeah, and American and European banks may have collapsed in 2008, but we never lost our belief in the fact that, that our money or that they were good for our money because the government backed them. And yeah, well, and the, it, it's quite interesting at the moment because someone asked me the question the other day, what, what, how come the government backed the banking system in 2008 but doesn't bank the crypto system in 2022? And I go, because the government doesn't believe in the crypto system. So I've heard you talk about the differences. I'm going to end with this and then let anybody ask questions. But I've heard you talk about the difference between, say, you're such a worldly man, given your accent and all. Um, but you, you're good at sort of understanding the difference in approaches between the, the financial institutions of the various cultures. And, and I've heard you give this, uh, I want to say it's a Tiger River Mountain sort of an, an, uh, analogy before. And I think it's really good for everyone to hear that on this call, because as Crayons, this is a big struggle for us, I think. Uh, but go ahead and give, if you don't mind, share that thought. And then I want to I want to add on and ask a question. I think you're referring to a slide that I sometimes use of a tiger in a river. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, and a mountain. There was a research uh, document that came out uh, where some academics looked at the movements of the eyes of students when they saw a picture of a tiger in a river. And they found that Western students saw the tiger first, then the river, then the mountains, then the sky. But Asian students saw the sky, the mountains, the river, and the tiger in that sequence and it's basically our brains are wired a certain way and in very different ways depending on where you come from um and what i liked about this research is specifically understanding that asia for example works very much on a collective basis um and we may look at them and say oh they're all subservient well they're not they're working on the basis of family and community and society first and the individual last whereas in europe and america we are much more selfish to be honest and focus on ourselves first maybe and then our family and then our society and community it's a different sequence yeah and and when i look at that sequence too i also think of the threat matrix right the we tend to like think the tiger is our immediate threat not noticing that the river is is draining behind it or that there are other bigger issues uh, to tackle and, and what would actually solve the tiger problem might not be related to the tiger. And that's where, when I look at sort of the long distance planning, particularly around digital, um, you know, you've been saying for years, video banking, branches, blah, you know, but it took the pandemic and that catalyst for everyone to sort of just make that leap. Um, and And I think that, Others made that leap more easily and not the Western portion of it because they were already kind of there. You look at China and as you mentioned, uh, Ant Forest and, and some of those other things. Do you think that um, there's a chance for credit unions given their size and being nimble for them to sort of leapfrog that if they can sort of you know look past the tigers in the way? Absolutely. I mean, I always come back to 
a basic point, which is these days you can create a fantastic business from your bedroom. Uh, there's a company I interviewed the other day, and you, you'll find it on my blog, and uh, they're called Stable. And um, it's basically a young guy, rich council, um, who grew up on a farm in Britain, in remote Britain, Somerset, um, and didn't want to be a farmer. So as soon as he left college, he went and joined a bank in, in London. And then he kind of wondered why it is that farmers don't hedge their, pro their agricultural products and realized because it's very difficult and it's very complicated. So he then went back to his dad's farm and launched a fintech company. Uh, this is in 2016. You need to read the whole story. It's a great story. But that fintech company is now a unicorn. It's going to be, you know, it's worth over a billion dollars, uh, created in a barn on a farm. Uh -huh. Yeah, because a good idea doesn't matter where it comes from. I, I totally get that. Um, yeah. And you, one guy can do that. It doesn't, it doesn't take a crowd. You know, one guy yeah. with a good idea or, or girl yeah. you know, can or create girl. something amazing. And yeah, credit, yeah. Unions, credit unions can do that too if they, you know, just if, if they shake off the, the blinkers. Yeah, I think that's the, 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 the blinders, I believe, is the, the word you're in, in our language. But blinkers are good too. We um, are two, two societies separated by an ocean. <laughs> so uh let's take if you don't mind uh chris i'd like to take some questions for the group sure. uh does anybody if you don't mind put your question in the chat and uh we'll uh go ahead and get you unmuted and um you know i i know uh there's at least a few people i always know that have a, a question or two um let's see well, if no one else does michael must have one Mike, 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 sometimes always, but I want to hear, I want to give other folks a chance first because we've already had our time, Chris, but I appreciate that. That was fun. Yeah. Yeah. I monopolized it. It's, uh, <laughs> so go ahead put your chat in, uh, put it in the chat here and we'll get you. I know Glenn will have a question. Yeah. Glenn. Go ahead, Glenn. I'm, I'm in a very busy place. So I'm trying to stay quiet, but um, <laughs> you, um, and I'm also trying to give other people a chance as well. Your digital twinning idea, I don't know if you saw, I put this in there. The example I thought of that, which is almost obsolete already now because of music streaming. But I know that when you bought a vinyl record in the last you know, 10 years or so, it often came with a digital download code. I mean, I think that's almost what you're suggesting is, okay, you buy a physical representation of something and you automatically get the digital one. Basically, there's a ride along. Is that, is that a fair comparison? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I I still struggle with digital twin, um, and maybe it's an age thing because I actually like to have the physical thing. So, if I could give you an example, if I buy a, a work by Monet or Picasso, which I could never afford, but if I could afford it, I, I brought it. Um, what would I do with the physical thing? Well, I'd have it in pride of place in my house. If I got the digital version of that, that could be cut and pasted by anybody into a PowerPoint or whatever. Um, it's not the same thing, is it? Uh, so I'm kind of, on the one hand, going a digital twin of me makes sense in the metaverse, but non-fungible tokens of art doesn't quite make sense to me. And I do have NFTs. Um, but my digital, my digital twin is more around commerce and trade and transaction and relationship because of connectivity. Uh, if I'm investing in something, I still sit there and say, I'm not sure whether a digital file has the same sort of value as the physical entity. Yeah. I, it may just be an age thing, but you know, I kind of sit there at the moment, for example, I, on my desk, I have a um, physical cell from the Jungle Book, the 1966 Disney movie of Mowgli and Baloo, because that's one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. If I had the digital version, I wouldn't care, but I really care about this one because yeah. it's right in front of me. And there's kind of a similar example to that. I know The Economist ran a story on the metaverse and NFTs. And as part of it, they kind of did an experiment and they turned the cover, the, the illustration they did into an NFT. 
and held an auction. I think they wound up getting like $400,000 for it and then gave it to charity. And then like one of their readers just ripped the cover of the magazine off the, the you know, that week's issue, taped it to his wall. And said, can you explain to me how this is any different? Which I thought kind of touche, it kind of the same thing you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and maybe I'm someone who doesn't get it, but that's exactly what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, which is, you know, at the moment, I think most NFTs are brought by crypto billionaires who invested early in Bitcoin and other um, cryptocurrencies and can afford to waste it. Yeah. Um, those of us in the real world with real money are going, what the hell? <laughs> well, I, but, I, but let me take your example. Um, not to knock it down, but let me, let me take your example. So you've okay. got a physical sell from a Disney movie. That's a fantastic find. But if you wanted a physical sell from say the toy story, uh, original 1995 toy story, it doesn't exist. However, no. that movie was originally, there was a first file. There was a first cut of it that was used to duplicate it. And it was a series of frames that were rendered by the original Pixar platform, which was the next. So the challenge is, is can you prove that that, like, I could say, yeah, I could draw Mogwai and I could say that was my cell, but can you prove that that's a true Disney one? Now you can, because on the back of yours, there's a certificate that says this came from the Disney archives. You probably bought it from one of the, one of the true, you know, auctions or, or where they sell those. But if you could get a digital version of, if I had a digital version of the, the written of the original, um, Toy Story scenes that was one of the many in the 30 frames per second video that I knew for a fact came from that file, that could be valuable. Now that said, well, well there's two things in point. there. There's yeah. two things in there, John. One is I'm a huge fan of the idea of using digital services, particularly distributed ledger and blockchain, for provenance to prove something that exists yeah, actually came from the the the, the the place that you say it came from. Um, there's a great program on the BBC called Fake or Fortune, where they spend an hour trying to prove whether you know, Picasso or Monet actually painted the painting that you claim was painted by Picasso or Monet. Um, and they go through a whole range of different scientific approaches to try and prove that. If that was on a distributed ledger token on a blockchain at the time it was issued, which is what NFT is all about, then that, that would be great. Um, and by way of your example, I did try and through the same company that I got the Jungle Book um, cell from, get a cell for the Lion King. But the Lion King didn't have any cells because it's a digital format. Um, could I get the first file production? How could I prove the first file production? It's part of the challenge. I mean, I'm looking at you sitting with all your guitars in the background there, and you may say, oh, that guitar was Jimi Hendrix's guitar. Well, how do you prove that? Oh, exactly. I got, there's a guitar behind me I use as an example of this, uh, which is, it looks like the most beautiful Gibson Les Paul you've ever seen, but it's a pure fake from China. Uh, and you wouldn't know it unless you knew what to look for. So your point is well taken. I think we're saying the same that. thing. I would, I would know that because you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> but but your point is well taken so we're right I at time, so I, time but i see i see cat had a both yeah, a comment yeah she also. has a great question if if uh if you're willing to stick around for it i'm willing to entertain if not you're welcome to yeah. write it up we, 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 we do one time. more okay so she says uh she wants your perspective on she says she's in the client call but um your perspective on open finance and the api economy as a building as a way to build the financial inclusion so open finance is a great idea. Um, it's picked up a lot of traction and it will definitely be part of how we do finance um, now and in the future. Um, the idea of financial inclusion is that you can actually start to provide financial services without having to be a fully fledged bank. Equally, you can provide payments and transactions and trade and lending and investment without actually being a bank. Um, and so I always come back to that long-standing quote from Bill Gates, it, which is, we need banking, but we don't need banks from the 1990s. And again, as you'll know from my blog, 
I've I've said many times Bill Gates was wrong. We need payments and we don't need banks to, to do payments or transactions or investing or lending. But banking is the only thing that can be done by a bank because it's regulated and licensed. And that goes to the heart of everything else we've covered so far. So in open finance, I think it's going to be interesting, and particularly from inclusion, that you can provide a whole range of financial services without a bank involved. But as soon as you talk about banking as a service or you want a, a deposit account with you know, a true bank service, then that has to be provided by a bank. And what then gets interesting, because someone asked me the question some years ago, why do banks think financial inclusion is all about charity? Um, which is, it's not. It's actually a really profitable and good area to focus upon, um, particularly if you do it well. Then the greatest example is WeBank in China, run by Tencent's um, WeChat, uh, which administers accounts for 47 cents a year, less than half a US dollar. Uh, and it does that because it uses what they call the ABCD of technology, artificial intelligence, blockchain, cloud, and um, data analytics. ABCD, I love that. Okay, last question. This is it. Uh, if I did a metaverse version of this, would you join it? Would you be my guest speaker? Would you put no. on the thing and join me? You won't do it? You won't join no. me in the metaverse? Why no. not? Don't like it. <laughs> Just wouldn't you wouldn't want to be in it? I, I, I mean, I because it's you, okay, John. Fine. I probably I bet would, Brett would. But, um, <laughs> but but after my experiences of, uh, I, I'm not a big gaming guy, and if I'm honest, I've done quite a bit just to find out about the metaverse, Decentraland in particular, um, Second Life before it. Um, I just think it's all a, a bit sort of you know a, a stuff that's not that relevant to real life, and I'd rather deal with people in real life. Uh, that's my preference too, but I'm interested in what it would even be like. And more importantly, I'd be interested in exactly what you just said, like putting that fish out of that water and seeing how he reacts and and, and in that moment what yeah. things look and like. If we did this in the metaverse, you'd find that I'd be an amazing looking crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. We're going to end on that. You are, you as always are an amazing looking crocodile. And thank you so, so much for your time. I hope you just and your don't family turn me well. into shoes. Okay, or a jacket. Yes. Or a belt. If you go to Amazon, <laughs> or buy this book. Yeah. yeah. Go to Amazon, <laughs> buy this book. We'll let everybody know. It'll be on the podcast. We're on our podcast. We'll also push it out. It was a great book. Uh, in all seriousness, Chris, I learned a lot. Thank you, as I always do. Thanks for, thanks for, thanks for keeping sharing. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, John. Well done, guys. <laughs>